Right, here's a video on the Declaration of Independence with a little review of the events leading up to it and then uh, an analysis of the Declaration of Independence and its importance. Uh, as you know, I like to uh, put things on a graph, so we're going to look at a graph here and we'll, on the horizontal line we'll have time and on the vertical line we'll have uh, the desire for independence. So let's take a look at some of these acts and as we look at this, as we go through time, um, analyze how much they led us towards independence, and we're gonna see a lot of ups and downs in this line where people were worked up about some act, and then things calmed down, and then worked up about an act, things calmed down, um, and to the point where we eventually end up with, uh, they can't take any more of it. And if you look at the time uh, that this starts with 1763, we know the Declaration of Independence, at least hopefully you know, is in 1776. Just to be, uh, you know, it's a decent amount of time that passes between the two 13 years. Uh, you guys studied the Proclamation of 1763 following the French and Indian War. And as you know, it made a line going up the Appalachian Mountains to prevent uh, American colonists from settling west, keep them out of the Ohio Valley. Uh, if you remember, that was precipitated by Pontiac's Rebellion, which the Native Americans didn't want British colonists coming this way. So the king proclaimed nobody would go west, and it angers the colonists because they wanted to go west, they felt that they had earned it with the French and Indian War, when they were being denied one of their rights as Englishmen by the proclamation. So it makes some people mad, it makes people that want to go west mad, and maybe in principle people in the coast, but people living in Boston, New York, and they're not that upset about it because they weren't planning on going there anyway. This is more the backcountry people or the people that don't have good land on the east coast. So it makes people upset, but as you see in this, you know, not terribly upset, they're not way up here in Independence, there's some anger in, uh, towards this, but not a ton. The Sugar Act in uh, 1860, I'm sorry, I should say 1764, wrong year, uh, makes um, more people mad because uh, if you remember, uh, because of the French and Indian War, Britain had a huge amount of debt and they wanted to have that paid off and they felt the colonists should pay their share of it. So they passed a bunch of acts, one of them being the Sugar Act. This is under George Grenville, the Minister of Finance. Um, and the Sugar Act and some other laws passed along with it said that they were going to require the colonists to start paying their taxes, uh, going to customs inspectors, basically a crackdown on the smuggling that they'd been allowed to get away with for over 100 years with solitary neglect. This ends solitary neglect, and it makes many people mad. But think about who makes us mad, who gets mad about this. It's mostly merchants. People like John Hancock was upset about it. He gets arrested and brought to trial over smuggling. But it's not necessarily angering the average common uh, colonist because... Although if prices went up, that would affect them. They're, you know, they weren't directly affected by the Sugar Act. The Stamp Act, we know, is a big one, right? Stamp Act impacts everybody. 1765, um, where uh, they had to put a stamp on all paper products, newspapers, legal documents, house deeds, newspapers, uh, playing cards, and dice had stamps on them. Here's a picture of a stamp they would put on these items. And this made everybody mad. It was the first direct tax on the colonies. As opposed to the Sugar Act, the Sugar Act really wasn't out of the realm of what they had already done with the Navigation Acts. It was regulating trade, and under mercantilism, Parliament had the right to regulate trade. The Stamp Act much different because it was a tax on um, internal things in the colonies, something that the colonies had always only taxed themselves through their colonial legislatures who they voted for. So they felt that they had more control over everyday direct taxes because if one of their colonial legislatures pass the tax they didn't like, they could just vote for new people the next time. But both of these things bring up the cry of no taxation without representation. James Otis is a big person that cries that, um, John Adams, Sam Adams, because colonists did not send someone to Parliament and this act, which was a direct tax, was voted on by Parliament, where they had nobody that they could, uh, you know, they could vote out of Parliament if they didn't like it, so they were stuck with it. But the Stamp Act, we know, caused all kinds of problems. We know it uh, caused a bunch of riots. We have this guy being tarred and feathered. He has a noose around his neck. He's not actually going to be hung. So this is something that makes sure everyone understands the Stamp Act riots did not hang and kill anybody, but they would tar and feather the stamp collector, which looks silly and humiliating, but is also incredibly painful. When they take the tar off, it's hot tar, it can take off parts of skin, cause all kinds of uh, permanent damage. So this is not just this you know, goofy looking thing. It's actually you know, a pretty terrible ordeal to be suffering through. So the Stamp Act riots uh, with uh, tarring and feathering. They break down Thomas Hutchinson's house. Here's a picture of people in the background. Again, these are effigies. These, they hung effigies, which are physical representations of somebody, uh, like a stuffed dummy. They didn't actually hang the, st uh, the stamp collector. They just hung effigies of them. And they you know, see fires in the background, probably, probably Thomas Hutchinson's house, Hutchinson's house. 
So the Stamp Act rights. I mean, think about the Stamp Act gets repealed. When I said this line go down, because not so much because Britain was like, oh no, they're rioting and they've made their point. Really, the pressure to end the Stamp Act came from British merchants who weren't making any money because the real impact of the Stamp Act was the boycotts that were organized by Sons of Liberty and different colonial legislatures. We weren't buying anything from British merchants and they were getting hurt uh, incredibly financially. So they put pressure on Parliament to end the Stamp Tax. So the Stamp Tax was repealed, the Stamp Act was repealed before it ever went into effect. Um, and so we see the line go down. Now, I'll talk about the Declaratory Act in a second, but this is important because there's writings. If you read documents afterwards, they hail the king as being an enlightened monarch, someone that's listened to his people, that when they petitioned to him, he put pressure on parliament. And whether that's true or not, it's not a uh, problem. It's probably not true that the king put pressure on him. But what is true is that the colonists were, okay, they were upset. The line spikes up here, but then they're not upset. They said, okay, things are back to the way they were. They repealed the Stamp Act piece of legislation that passed that hardly anybody noticed was the Declaratory Act, which basically just said that Parliament still had the right to tax the colonies if they wanted to, but they're, you know, they're not actually passing a tax. It's more of a principle that Parliament was trying to establish that they could tax more if they wanted to. They just don't happen to be at the time. It didn't really pay, uh, cause much stir in the colonies because it wasn't an actual tax and got overlooked. Uh, but then we have the Townsend Acts. Uh, new uh, Minister of Finance, Charles Townsend's in uh, office. He passes a new set of taxes on things that, again, could be regulated by the Navigation Acts. Tea, paint, lead, um, glass, uh, you know, a bunch of enumerated goods, specific goods, to raise money. Again, this is a revenue act to raise money to pay for the war debt. And the colonists are, again, they're outraged just like they were before. This is where John Dickinson from Pennsylvania writes his famous pencil letters from a Pennsylvania farmer where he raises the issue of no taxation without representation, that he pleads with Parliament, you know, look what happened with the Stamp Acts. Do you want that kind of, you know, riots and violence that we had then? If you don't, then repeal the, the Townsend Acts. And most of those taxes were repealed with the exception of the tax on tea. So as we go forward after that, things go good again. Where they're happy they get, you know, they're, they feel they've been listened to. However, the Boston Massacre in 1770, again, another spike, maybe a little higher than the other ones, because now we have actual deaths happening. If you're right about it, mostly it's uh, you know, who knows who fired the first shot. If there was a misunderstanding, the colonists were throwing snowballs. A bunch of scared British soldiers were there. Um, and it's caused because the British brought a bunch of troops from the from the frontier to Boston to, um, to look over the collection of duties, and it caused a lot of tension. So you can say Boston was just kind of waiting for this. To, something like this was bound to happen. So the Boston Massacre, depicted here by Paul Revere, this engraving, which makes it look like there was this organized line of fire of these soldiers that were ready to fire upon the colonists. Not at all what happened. It was absolutely chaos. There's some stuff in the book about that. Crispus Attucks is the first one to die. Uh, a freed slave, freed escaped slave. So Paul Revere makes a, you know, uh, takes an opportunity to make a lot of propaganda. It has it circulated throughout the colonies and the colonists are mad about the Boston Massacre. Um, but then after a while, again, things go down. There's about 1770. <clears throat> the next big event is uh, not really that big of an event, but the Gatsby Affair off the coast of Newport, Rhode Island, uh, 1772, where a British schooner, a boat that was supposed to enforce the Navigation Acts and the Sherry Act, ran aground in shallow water. Colonists rode out. They roughed up the crew. They shot but didn't kill the captain, then burnt the boat. So it showed more colonial resistance. When the British came to Rhode Island and asked for witnesses, Everybody said they didn't see anything. They didn't know anything. So nothing came from it. Uh, this should probably go down. I, you know, I didn't do that. But there's probably after that a little bit of a, a drop in uh, people being upset. But then another rise with the Tea Act when Britain, when Parliament tried to force Americans to buy their tea. It actually dropped the price of tea, but they were going to force them to buy it by strictly enforcing no more smuggling from the Dutch. Um, and it created a monopoly for the British Tea Company. So the colonists were mad about this, even though the price of tea went down. So we're not going to fall for that dirty trick. So they have the Boston Tea Party pictured here in December of 1773, where they march to the harbor, dressed as Mohawk Indians, throw all the tea into the uh, Boston Harbor. They destroy something like over a million dollars worth of tea. So this isn't, you know, again, it sounds like, oh, there's, you know, no harm, no, you know, no foul type of thing. They, you know, there was a, like someone, you know, an innocent demonstration, but that's a lot of money of tea they destroyed. So the re reaction of Parliament was to pass the Coercive Acts. Just remember, the Coercive Acts was a series of acts that closed the Port of Boston, uh, suspended the Massachusetts legislature, uh, it, um, it took town meetings and made them, uh, they could only be called by the royal governor, and he could call them at places that were difficult for people to get to. 
So you think about this, it closed down their livelihood the, with the Port Act by closing down uh, um, any ships coming in or out. So that's going to hurt them economically. It took away their right to self-government, which they had always had since the very beginning with the general court and town meetings. And it renewed a new quartering act. The, there's a quartering act that I didn't talk about back here in 1765 or 1764, where the British could force American uh, colonists to house soldiers in either ends of their homes. This new quartering act made it uh, so they could house them in any building. And they started using things like uh, churches, like Puritan churches in Boston. Uh, they would use to house soldiers and use them for stables. So the course of acts are considered unacceptable. And in addition, they passed the Quebec Act, which uh, the colonists were upset about because it allowed the French uh, citizens there, when the, the French and language citizens, are Brit it's a British colony now, where they allowed them to uh, have Catholicism as their main religion, which we know the Puritans hated, and didn't allow them to have representative government, so it seemed like tyranny. So the first Continental Congress meets to discuss that, and they come up with a unified colonial opposition to it. They demand a repeal of the course of acts. And maybe what's more important is that they call for colonies to start raising militias to prepare to defend themselves. And that leads to the Lexington and Concord incident. You had British in Boston were marching to Concord, Massachusetts, not New Hampshire, Concord, Massachusetts, to seize weapons at an arsenal. And when they got to Lexington, they were met by a bunch of Minutemen on Lexington Green. Here's a painting of the famous writer of Paul Revere, writing to warn them that the British are coming. Uh, didn't write alone, wrote with two other guys, but uh, he you know, gets credit for it. Um, so at Lexington, several, uh, there was probably about a couple dozen uh, Lexington Minutemen there waiting for him. Shots are fired. Again, it's not clear who shot first or if there was an order for it, but someone shoots and then everybody shoots and several uh, Minutemen are dead. Then the British march on to Concord to find that the colonists had already removed their weapons, and then the colonists fight them. See, there's a that picture of Lexington Green, by the way, is like British soldiers over here, and the colonists. And this painting's not really a great depiction of it either, because it happened like at you know some I think 5 a.m. in the morning, so it probably would have been completely dark at the time. But then they march all the way to Concord, and then the, the colonists fight them on the way back. They have to fight their way across the North Bridge all the way back to Boston as the colonists fought guerrilla style warfare that they learned in the French and Indian War behind trees and farm, uh, you know, uh, stone walls and things like that. They didn't come out and fight them in a military formation, just kind of picked them off as they went. Eventually then we go to the Bunker Hill. In Bunker Hill we have the first, uh, I might say formal battle of the war, and you read about that, and there'll be some stuff coming up on that next week uh, when you're going to look at some of the, the engagements of the war. I'll have some videos for you to watch. Um, but at Bunker Hill, uh, the Americans defended the hill, trying to get, uh, control the hills around Boston so that they, uh, the British wouldn't have be able to shoot down upon the, uh, the city itself. It's a, uh, we know it's a loss for the American colonists as far as they leave the hill, but a moral victory because they stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British as they charge up the hill three times. So either way, we, you know, we'll get into that a little bit next week, but you see this tension rising. It's getting worse. Bunker Hill, first real battle, or at least planned battle, so the, the, the line's way up there. It drops a little bit. They offer the Olive Branch Petition. They want there's a last attempt to peace after even after Bunker Hill. They said, you know what? Maybe we uh, need to, um, you know, we don't want to go to war. Uh, you know, the battles are bad enough. Do we really want to go to war, Britain? Let's make one last peace offering. If the king will respect us and go back to the way things were, then maybe this can all be forgotten. So they offer the Olive Branch Petition. The king won't even read it. Doesn't even open it. Ignores it entirely. And then. Not long after that, they passed a prohibitory act closing the port of Boston, or actually closing all colonial ports. It was a complete embargo or blockade of all the colonial ports that they figured, if we, let's make them all suffer so that way they'll, they'll beg for forgiveness. Even if Boston won't, maybe the other colonies will want to fall in line because they don't want to be affected by it. And then so we, have, we know Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense. You guys read about that. He makes a uh, plain spoken argument to the American people about why they should go to independence, that the king and the monarchy is a bad institution, and that independence was the only choice. And then we have the Declaration of Independence in 1776. So think about, so I wanted to do a little background of that as we get to the Declaration of Independence, because there is a long line of, uh, of, of events and reactions and you know ups and downs during this whole time between 1763 and 1776, 13 years since the beginning of this. And even when we think about the Stamp Act, this act that um, seems so, you know, some people might say, oh, that was the start of the revolution. This is really what got it rolling. But that's still 11 years before the Declaration of Independence. 
there's a lot of attempts here by moderates to try to reconcile and make good and just repair the old relationship. It's not to the point when we get to some of these battles, like where you might say the course of acts, Lexington and Concord, Bunker Hill, where people say we're past the point of uh, no return. Like Thomas uh, Paine said, a fallacious dream of reconciliation. And we have the Declaration of Independence. At that point, you could say it was too late to apologize. the globe and we're standing on the ground Screaming across the waves you can't hear the sound There's no fair trials, no train, no liberties No tea We've colonized America We won't stand for tyranny It's too late to apologize It's too late I said it's too late to apologize It's too late You've paid your foolish tax, read the acts And they just won't do Wanna make it clear we believe this much is true A man were created with certain unalienable rights Among these life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness It's too late to apologize It's too late It's too late to apologize It's too Richard Henry Lee from Virginia actually offered the first resolution for independence on you know, June 2nd, 1776. And in this resolution, if you look at this, some of these words you'll find in the Declaration of Independence, that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. They're absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain and ought to be totally resolved. Uh, it talks about how they should make alliances and that they should plan a form of uh, a confederation to, uh, to then go forward and then uh, you know govern themselves. So Richard Henry Lee proposes this on June 2nd. So this is a whole month before, a uh, month and two days before the actual declaration. But he proposes it as, okay, we've, you know, we've crossed the, the Rubicon. We can't go back. Uh, it's time for us to make a decision. Um, the Congress, the Continental Congress, appoints a committee of five on June 11, 1776, made up of St. Thomas Jefferson here, Benjamin Franklin back in the, over here, John Adams in the front left, and Robert Livingston and Roger Sherman in the back. So this group of five was commissioned with go uh, form a committee and write a declaration, put Richard Henry Lee's proposal, but write a full declaration outlining why we're doing all this. Um, 
We know Thomas Jefferson ends up writing it. Thomas Jefferson is 33 years old. He's the youngest member of the Continental Congress. He's a lawyer by training. Um, John Adams has been really the much more of the, the person on the scene at the time. Uh, you know, ben, everybody knows Benjamin Franklin, but John Adams was one of the agitators. He's been there from the beginning, right? The, the, the crucible in Boston through all the Boston massacre and everything else has been going on. But John Adams, at least as far as John Adams in his memoir says, he insists that Thomas Jefferson has to write it. And he accounts for it by telling they had a disagreement about it or an argument about it. And Adams said, you have to write the Declaration of Independence for three reasons. One, because I'm obnoxious, meaning John Adams, and everybody dislikes me. He knows that he's opinionated and uh, people in Congress find him uh, um, kind of offensive. So he feels that if he writes it, then they'll just shoot it down because he's the one that wrote it. So that's his first reason. The second reason is he says Jefferson's a Virginian, and most of the events have happened in Boston. So it needs to look like a Virginian's at the head of this business. It has to be someone not from Massachusetts to show that it's, uh, all the colonies write in this Declaration of Independence. So John Adams says, number one, I'm obnoxious, nobody likes me. Two, you're a Virginian. He says, three, you write ten times better than I do. Uh, this is one of those interesting things about history. We don't know if that's true. John Adams talks about it. Jefferson, who wrote a ton of letters and a ton of diary entries and a ton of memoirs, never mentions this conversation. So it makes you wonder if this really happened or if John Adams wanted to write the Declaration of Independence. And maybe this committee said, no, you should not do it. They brought Jefferson to do it. So that was John Adams' way of maybe saving face or making it look like it was his choice to have Jefferson write it. But either way, Jefferson is commissioned to write this by this committee. He uh, and he, uh, He's the main author of it. On July 2nd, the Committee 5 reports what Jefferson wrote back to Congress. So think about that. This is formed on June 11th. It takes almost so what, about three weeks for him to write it. Um, and on July 2nd, Congress voted to accept the resolution of Richard Henry Lee to declare independence. So we think about this. July 2nd is actually when we declared independence. It's not when we ratified the full declaration, but it's when we actually declared independence. So every 4th of July, we are living a lie. But on 4th of July, they vote and they adopt the Declaration of Independence as fully written by Thomas Jefferson after they debate and cross off some things. And we have our breakaway from England. Oops. What's important of this, let's think about some stuff about the Declaration of Independence and why the document stands out. The, it shows a shift in the radical influence since the Stamp, Stamp Act Congress. Back in 1765, after the Stamp Act, we had the riots, but also we had nine states, or nine colonies got together at the Stamp Act Congress in New York and discussed a reaction to it. You remember reading about that? They talked of rights of Englishmen, not natural rights. They still thought of themselves as Englishmen. What rights do we have have been protected in England for all people living in England? Um, we're going to see a shift now. They're going to talk about natural rights. At the Stamp Act Congress, they acknowledge Parliament's sovereignty to make laws regulating trade, it's just not direct taxes. So in 1765, they weren't talking about independence at all. They said we shouldn't. Parliament shouldn't pass direct taxes. They can regulate trade with the Navigation Acts and even the Sugar Act. Uh, but on principle, they can't pass direct taxes. But by the Declaration, they're talking about natural rights. Uh, very enlightened idea. And they're not talking about the rights of Englishmen anymore. They don't consider themselves Englishmen. Um, in the Declaration, they don't want to acknowledge the par the Parliament's sovereignty at all. They're going to say that the that Parliament has no power to regulate anything in the colonies, that they uh, are free and independent. Um, think about who this was geared towards. Certainly the American people, not all American people were super excited about breaking away from England, and certainly most of them didn't want to go to war, which you know obviously was going to have to happen. So they had to convince the American people that this was now the only choice. Thomas Paine's common sense went a long way with helping that, but they had to convince the American people with this document that this is the only choice. They had to convince the British people, particularly the merchant class. These people weren't thinking in the moment. They were these were, you know, the founding fathers were thinking, you know, steps ahead of the game. They were playing chess. So they know that after the war, they're going to have to repair their ties with Britain. Britain will be their main trading partner. They're mostly British by heritage. So they're going to have to, um, they don't want to make the British people upset with them. They want to make their break away from the government, but the British people, they want to keep as trade partners. So they can't be too offensive to them. So they have to make a case that they that this declaration, this separation is necessary. And then they think about they have to make an appeal to foreign uh, monarchs, the French king specifically, but other monarchs, because they know if they go to war, and this declaration will most likely lead to war, that they can't fight it on their own. They're going to need help. So they need to make sure, when Jefferson writes this, he needs to make sure that he attacks the English king, but not kings in general. Thomas Paine's common sense, you know, attacks monarchy in general. This says monarchy is a bad form of government. It makes no sense. 
Jefferson tries to refrain himself from doing that and just attack the English king but not offend the French king or the Spanish king or any other kings that they might seek help from. So when we look at this, we look at the grievances, they're aimed at the king, not parliament, which is also interesting because I think of all those acts weren't passed by the king. The only thing the king really had a direct hand in is a, <clears throat> excuse me, the proclamation of 1763. Parliament passed all those other acts. But when we look at our list of grievances, they're all aimed at the king. They put all the blame on his at his feet. Think about why that is. It's because the king is the one recognizable figurehead for the government. If the colonists don't even vote for members of parliament, many of them probably don't even know who the members of parliament are. It's tough to get the American people or the world mad at a faceless parliament. It's a lot easier to get them mad at the king. Can you imagine that's kind of like you think today in politics. It's a lot easy, no matter who the president is, to blame one person, the president, that everybody knows and to say, oh, you're congressmen, you're senators. Because many of us, uh, I shouldn't say me, but you know, a lot of people don't even know who their congressmen and senators are. So it's tough to get mad at them. They can all picture the president. Well, the same thing here. They can all get mad at the king. It's tough to get people angry at that parliament. <clears throat> so let's take a quick walk through some of the text of the Declaration of Independence, some of the important parts. Uh, the first part of this is a statement of purpose. Jefferson has to make a case to the world, tell the people why we're doing what we're doing. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them with another, right? So the course of human events, that, that's essentially history, right? Throughout history, when one people, one group of people have to break away from another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. You know, a very enlightened kind of way of thinking about things. Uh, the powers of the earth, a separate and equal station, right? That nobody's born into uh, nobility, nobody should be born into uh, monarchy or anything like that. We're all separate and we're all at equal stations. The laws of nature, right? And nature is God. Think about that. Nature is God. He's not talking about a Christian God or a Hebrew God or a Muslim God. He's just saying nature is God, a very enlightened, neist way for him to refer to God. Think about why he does that. It's all incorporating. Anybody can get behind that, or at least I should say most people can get behind that. So uh, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires they should declare the causes which have held them to the separation. So he's saying, look, to, for all the people that, if we're going to do this, we need to tell people why we're, we are doing this, right? We're not just doing it impulsively on a whim. There's reasons for why we're doing this, and we're going to tell you what they are. And this is the most famous part, is philosophy of government. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator. Again, not a specific denominational creator, but their creator, a general term. Endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This should remind us of John Locke from England, who didn't talk about in unalienable rights, but talked about natural rights, rights that can't be taken away. He said life, liberty, and property. Jefferson changes it to pursuit of happiness. Think about John Locke when he said property. Again, he wasn't talking about land. He was talking about you know what you own, your pursuit of happiness, your ability to support yourself and have a livelihood. Jefferson changes that to pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. You know, that's popular sovereignty, right? Government gets its power from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it, right? So government is only legitimate if the people consent to it. When government becomes destructive to these ends, meaning protecting our life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, the people have to alter or abolish it, change the government or overthrow it altogether, Institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its power in such form to, the, to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness, right? This is very much right out of John Locke's second treaty of the government. He talks about all this stuff. This is essentially the social contract. The idea that people have to consent to their government and the government's only legitimate while they agree to it. Otherwise, they can change it or they can overthrow it. And this idea of natural rights, a social contract. He goes on to say, prudence indeed will dictate the governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. Think about prudence, right? That's like, you know, reasonable. Like, you know, the fact that we're not going to be impulsive, we're going to be patient, we're going to think things through, we're prudent. That means we're not just going to change things because of one little thing. You know, we would have done that with the Stamp Act if it was if we weren't prudent. We would have done it with the Townsend Act of the Boston Massacre. So he's saying, look, prudence says that we're not going to change things for light and transient causes, meaning, you know, little things. Um, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while the evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms of which they are accustomed. 
people are more likely to put up with a lot of stuff than go through the trouble of something like a revolt as long as they can suffer it. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. So he's talking about, look, a long train of uses. This is the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, the Townsend Act, the Boston Massacre, the Gatsby Incident, the Course of Acts, a long train of abuses, things that have gone on for you know 13 years at that point. They're trying to reduce them under absolute despotism to take away all their rights. Think about the Course of Act, closing down Boston Port, taking away their government. Then the Prohibitory Act, closing down all the ports. It's their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for the future security, right? It's not just their right to overthrow it. They have a duty, sense to the world, an enlightened duty to overthrow that government and come up with a new one. Such has been the patient sufferance for these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. Think about this. All the stuff that he's been talking about uh, with prudence, and the, they've been putting up a lot of uh, abuses for a long time, the patient sufferance, this is really geared towards French, uh, and probably the British citizens too, but the French saying, look, uh, to the king of France, we're going to need your help. We're not overthrowing the monarchy just because we don't like monarchy. We're not, you know, this is, we're not just uh, being petulant children. This is uh, a case of we've been uh, under despotism for all this time, and we are objecting to this king, not to kings in general. We've been patient, and we've been suffering, but now it's time that we have to alter the former systems of government. The history of the present king of, um, of Great Britain is history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having a direct object, the establishment of absolute tyranny over the states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to the candid world. So I'm not going to read through all the grievances, but that's the next thing, this list of grievances. And uh, the one of the document, uh, the Google form questions you have to answer is on the grievances. And I want you to, uh, you know, I'll kind of, I'm not going to read through them, but they're also in your textbook. If you look them up, uh, the, the Declaration of Independence is uh, listed in the textbook, but also I'll put them up here so you can kind of like you pause the video and look at them. As I put them up, I'll just put a, a few at a time. Um, and the Google question is going to ask you to uh, look at these list of grievances and find five of them and connect them to something that actually happened and explain how this grievance is related to something that actually happened. So I'll put them up, stop talking, and then I'll, I'll advance it, but you can pause it so you can read through them. So then after the list of grievances, the last part of the declaration is just the, now the justification. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms, meaning we've made petitions, we've asked for them to redress our problems, we've asked for them to fix the problems. Our, petition, our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act by which the, may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people nor have we been wanting in attention to our British brethren. So basically saying, look, we've petitioned, the king hasn't listened, he's a tyrant, he's unfit to rule us. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by the legislature to extend unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We've reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We've appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which and inevitably interrupt our connection with correspondence. So we've told them many times, not just the British king, but the British people to Parliament, that um, we've appealed to them for justice, for the treat us as uh, they would treat other Englishmen. They too have been deaf in the voice of justice and consequently, we must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war and friends in peace. So since they haven't listened to our petitions, we must therefore uh, separate and then consider them they said, enemies in war, friends in peace. Then the last thing, the resolution, 
which is where we see Richard Henry Lee's resolution into this. We thought we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, and notice the United States now is no longer colonies, the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world. You now it's God, but it's not a Christian God or denominational God, the supreme judge of the world, and deist kind of God, for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the names and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right to be ought to be free and independent states. That they are absolved from the allegiance of the British Crown, that, they are, that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other things which independent states may do. So we are now breaking away of our own country, the United States of America. We can do all the things that uh, other countries can do. The last part, a very solemn ending, and for, this, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, again, God, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Think about that. Sometimes people might think that's melodramatic. We pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. But this declaration is essentially is a treason document. If we sign this, and John Hancock's the first one to sign it, signs it really big, so King George apparently says King George can see it without his spectacles. He's the first one to sign it, and everybody else who signs it is essentially signing you might think they're death warrant, right? Because they're now traitors if they sign this breaking away, traitors to Britain. If they lose the war, all of them could be held as traitors and then uh, executed as traitors. So they're they're literally pledging to each other our lives, our fortunes. I mean, if we lose the war, all this money we have, if we're wealthy planters and lawyers and merchants, that'll all be gone and our sacred honor. Um, uh, as they talked about this afterwards, someone had said to Ben Franklin, uh, you know, we, we need to stick together. We're hopefully, you know, if we don't all hang together, then this will, won't work. And Franklin said something to the effect of, well, we don't all hang together. We'll surely hang separately, meaning that we will be hung as traitors because of this document. So that's the Declaration of Independence. Uh, you have some uh, Google questions to answer about that. And email me if you have any questions.